good morning everyone finally we get started uh, with this exciting program and uh, i'm more excited that it's a friend uh, he's a mithul is more of a friend who's agreed to uh, get us started with the most basic which is about documentation and a very specific part on digitization for archiving i I'll, i'll leave aside the technical or the formal introduction because you all have read it and that is why you are here um mithul is a friend and uh, we connect, we met in amdabad because that uh, you must have understood that's where i'm from and what we connected most on was while we i was setting up we were setting up sept archives uh, uh, with sept university mithul and team were actually setting up similar processes at the navjeevan press so if you don't know of what navjeevan press does it's it's sort of a makeover than a very old traditional press um and uh, that is where we really connected because we had similarities in work they were also digitizing we were also documenting and digitizing for an archive so we started looking for these similar threads and since then we have had more to talk than just uh, catch up over chai or uh, chat uh, mithul is uh, mithul's background is architecture and uh, he's also a very accomplished photographer so i don't think i, I even remember that he's done architecture uh, we know him for his photography and uh, yeah he's one he's presented his work at many uh, forums and he's been awarded for his work at international and national uh, platforms and uh, yeah um, what is interesting is again um, our uh, paths cross because mithul also try, uh, stepped into the idea or the into the initiative of curation um, and that to for a city like amdabad so i'm sure it meant uh, many different things compared to the way we see curating at curating for culture uh so yeah we've have, we've have come a long way and uh, that's why he was the first person who came to my mind when i said okay we need to do an exercise on digitization and documentation especially given the current situations um how do you work with your archival material and how will you reproduce it within your household limits um and mithul happily agreed so thank you mithul for uh accepting the invitation planning it out so diligently for us um the plan of the day is very clear so i don't want to repeat it but yeah we have um, introductions to presentation with uh, mithul and certain subjects uh, in the first half he has a very quick short exercise for us and in the second half uh, he becomes more specific in terms of how do we post produce how do we respond to uh, as i said the current scenarios um, of uh, lockdown and limited resources um and there we might do a more uh, detailed exercise come back and discuss the same so that's it from my end uh, mithul over to you uh thank you so much uh, for kind introduction uh am i audible to everyone yes yes okay uh good morning everyone uh, i hope 10 o'clock on a saturday morning hasn't been a uh, difficult to join uh uh okay so uh what we will do is i'll i'll open up the presentation that we've made and uh, we'll start with introducing what uh, digitization is formally for again there's no one definition for it we'll look take a look at these things and then we'll move on to the processes the entire process of digitization where the actual conversion to digital format is one part of it so it's a long process we'll begin with that and at the end of the session just before lunch we'll do a small exercise uh, which we'll do live uh, not in the break also is my screen visible to everyone okay lovely uh so i think after the listing everyone listening to each other's projects we were sort of now come to realize why uh, what i meant when i said uh, digitization and processes digitization 
are very, very customized for each of our projects. And that's not limiting to the projects that we are talking about. Each institution, when they have to digitize, when they have to archive, they have set up, it, the process is very uh, flexible and customized to what materials they have, what repository they have, what is the end usage of that material. So I think this, I found a very interesting uh, quote to begin uh, the presentation where uh, what Richard brings to our attention is with the pace at which the world is moving, with uh, the digital uh, acceptance that we've begun with, these artifacts, these objects are getting lost in the process. So, uh, I mean, to put it in the simplest manner, it is a transfer of the analog material to uh, a digital format in electronic media. And uh, this is to put it in the simplest form, but when it comes to analog material, there's a vast range of uh, materials that we are talking about. Uh, in just this presentation, we saw things ranging from textiles when it comes to the Harikas, um, grandfather in laws kurtas. We saw large format architectural drawings. Uh, we saw this furniture, this jewelry. So each of these materials in itself has different processes, the way we take them forward, the way we digitize them into the digital uh, format. And then uh, by bond digital materials, what it means here is uh, Deepti's work, uh, which he mentioned, which you mentioned Deepti is entirely in the digital format, but we shot them digitally. So, the process other than the actual digitization is more or less very similar to what we do with, so when we convert a digital and the analog into a digital, we have a repository, which we need to structure, which we need to find a naming mechanism for, which we need to add keywords, metadata. So all of this process remains very similar to material that is born digital. Right? So once the, material is digitized, we are basically on the same platform when it comes to our digital repository. Uh, so to expand a little bit more on this uh, and expanding the definition of the conversion to digital material, I think when we go to the process, uh, a large part of the narratives that we want to talk about, the material, uh, the description of the materials that we want to talk about um, is uh, part of the process that we begin while we are digitizing uh, our repository, digitizing the objects. For example, uh, in once you digitize it, there is something called metadata and keywording where you can add on descriptions about the object that we have, which is not necessarily visible in the object, but which remains in the background file format. So this becomes very helpful uh, when we have the digital format, when especially when it's a larger archive, how do you go back to a particular drawing, say, how do you go back to a particular uh, photograph that you want to look about? Uh, for example, we one of the large projects that we've done was we digitized the photographic archive of uh, someone based in Ahmedabad, which had some 40,000 odd uh, objects in the form of negatives, in the form of transparencies. So. Once the object is digitized, if I want to know more about the photograph, this mechanism helps and is really efficient when it comes to adding narrative, adding description. It could be description of the material, it could be description of the period, the place, the location, all of it. Uh, okay, so to again, simplifying it even further, uh, two primary reasons why we digitize is one is a preservation strategy, uh, by which we mean once we have the objects digitized, once it's in the digital material, the lesser we have to handle the actual objects. And this becomes really important when it comes to when we realize the objects, the material of the objects are fragile, for example, or when there are times when we do not have access to these materials we are still able to access the content that we have um, i think in tana's case in your case tana we you might not have the access to the physical materials that you digitize but 
which doesn't stop you from then accessing and what we talked about it becomes a repository for uh, for the searching so yeah that brings upon the access tool and uh, the other is the preservation strategy where we we physically have to handle much lesser uh, the objects the materials than if we have a digital copy uh, other than that the access tool continuing on the access tool i think large part of everyone's uh, projects is the dissemination of these uh, of the content of the materials that you have and that really simplifies once you have a digital copy of each of these um, i believe that digitization is the base and after which whoever wants to disseminate it in any format takes it for further from there so if say for example some people want to make a digital uh, a blog or an instagram account of these things once you have the base ready you can move into that direction some people want to convert it into a physical object say a book or uh, reproducing an exhibition so again the base once the base of the digital uh, repository is ready then we can i mean there's flexibility to move into any direction that we want our project to go in this i think i believe i kept again uh, talk about the aspects of adding details and descriptions of the materials while we are in the act of digitizing this i'll move on to the process of digitizing where the actual act of converting the material falls somewhere in the middle of the process and there's a huge number of steps that we follow before that and there's a huge number of steps that we follow after that uh, and of course the final aim remains either to make it accessible to other users or to form a digital repository for our personal use but even when you talk about personal use it doesn't remain to the singles the primary stakeholders taking up this process it still is distributed maybe it is in the circle of your family maybe it is limited restriction to certain people maybe it not be public but it still will be distributed in some form or the other this is an exercise that we'll do at the end of it but i'll begin briefly talking about each of these points um and the reason i had asked uh, may i request you to think about what is why is it important how does digitization in how is it relevant to your projects is um, that's where we begin the process with identifying and selecting artifacts uh, so the simplest way which can also be really exhausting is once we have identified the materials we digitize everything uh, but the difficulty with that is digitization if you want to do it in a structured formal way is a very long process and when we are getting it done uh, commercially it can be really exhausting in terms of our finances so it is wise to first if we have our abstract if we have what we want to do with the project sort of ready uh, that can then lead to us identifying what parts of the archive would we want to take into the process of digitizing i think i've been repeating myself but there is no single approach that we does that everyone can follow when it comes to uh, digitizing it really depends on the kind of materials that we have the quality of materials that we have uh, one thing that is not added here is uh, our intent of usage of the digital files that we have at the end of our process of digitizing Uh, we'll talk about that a little more in uh, the following slides. But again, um, emphasizing on the last point in this slide, where what, which are the reasons that are most significant to your archive mission statement? Uh, this doesn't mean this is the only way to go about it. I see a lot of projects proposals are is are still in the process of finalizing a mission statement. figuring out what we are expecting out of this project so it's not that we are missing out on something if we are not doing this act of identifying selecting the artifacts but these are just general uh, ideal scenarios where it is it works slightly better if we have if we are clear about what our mission statement is and then based on that we can move on to figuring out what archives what part of the archive would we want to use 
Uh, so, Mithul, just one question. Sorry, if, uh, yes, if tell I me. In in our case, where we have about a lack of papers, ideally the first step would be to sitting and sieving through all those papers. Uh, ideally, yes. Uh, okay. Ideally, yes. Okay. Because once you so that brings to the next thing. Once you do that, is when you can actually sit down and categorize. Even before sure. categorizing, you can categorize and list these identified materials. So I'll. And, yeah, and that would also mean uh, getting somebody who is uh, who is able to handle fragile papers, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, this can be absolutely divided into two parts where uh, someone who is able to, who is trained to work with fragile material, archival material can be given the task of uh, physically categorizing the material. And then maybe your role can uh, begin once this basic categorization of physical objects is done, is when you can get involved and divide, categorize, uh, classify them into ways where you where it makes sense to you as a researcher does that make sense yeah so i'll i'll share another cell. so the project that i talk about where i mentioned we had uh, roughly 40000 negatives the first thing that we did in the process was we sat down with each with the entire material it took about i think about 10 days time to do that and uh, so I'll explain the nomenclature also along with it. But what we did was we sat down, we actually calculated, we made a list of how many transparencies do we have. This was a photo project. So how many transparencies do we have? How many film negatives do we have? How many prints do we have? And we made the list. This is a simple Excel sheet, but we did that in an Excel sheet. So when we actually begin with the process of using a scanner to do it, we know where to begin. Uh, so this is this what this represents is DP 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 is the name of the artist. DP is a transparency. Uh, this number here, fifty-seven, is the fifty-seventh box of transparencies that we have, and forty-two here is the number of slides, the number of transparencies that we have in that box. So even when we start, before we start handling these uh, materials and take it to the process of digitization. We did this entire process of uh, categorizing, classifying, and cal num counting these things. So which also makes it easy for us to plan the for the process. So if I know beforehand I have roughly 25,000 transparencies, I know I, I get a sense of timing the project how much time I can estimate the time we can take up to digitize this project. So that was transparencies. Then we have these, uh, what you see on the screen right now are film negatives. Uh, so for at the risk of reputation, what transparency is, is a, a, an analog photograph. It could be a film, it could be a transparency, but it is in the form of a slide. So you get a single, get slide projectors in uh, previously. So each slide goes into the project. So trans the first sheet that we saw was slides. So each box had say 47 slides. These, what we are looking at on the screen are, are film negatives, which are in the form of valets. So a film, when we shoot 35mm, we get 32 to 36 shots in it. And we have them, the negatives, in the form of a valet where there's six strips of these films with six photographs on each strip. So is this the mechanism bhi, uh, I'm sorry, does, is everyone comfortable with Hindi? Are there anyone who is, is there anyone who is, no? Okay, so I'll stick to English. Um, I don't speak Hindi. I am sorry, yes. So uh, that's sorry. Sort of also, no, no, that's absolutely. That uh, also defines ways with which you uh, find a counting mechanism or a naming convention for it. So because, these uh, film negatives valets would roughly have each have about 32 36 we didn't see it necessary to count the actual number of images in these film negatives so what we've done here is we've just calculated counted the number of film negatives that we have and we had the roughly, roughly 378 film negatives which then gives us a ballpark figure of how many actual images did we have uh, in the 
in the repository. So 378 into if I were to multiply it by say 30 images per, on an average per film, we get the number of uh, film negative that we have to do. Um, Sorry, yes. I just wanted to ask you, do you want to take questions at the end or should we just ask you as we, um, you know, as we come across so, and as we have So what I would suggest is maybe uh, type your questions in the chat box okay. and uh, we can take a break uh, after a couple of slides and we'll address those. So um, this was also really helpful because the process of digitizing the slide on a scanner, I'm talking about one mechanism, just a flatbed scanner, but the process of digitizing a slide on a scanner and digitizing a film negative on a scanner is very different. So that again gives me a sense to plan the project as to with what material do I begin digitizing and what material I can take after. This uh, was the third material that we had, which were 120 mm film negative. These are those square format film negatives that were there before we had the 35 mm negatives. Um, and then I think the last bit was the prints that we have. So, so most of these steps are sequential, but there are times when you have to do uh, these consecutively, simultaneously at the same time. Uh, for like you mentioned, Tana, your repository might have about a lakh thing. So it wouldn't be wise to set wait to you know, collect and count and categorize all of those first. Maybe you could do steps of say 20,000 things first, or you can do that at your own means. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? So, but just a basic sense of what kind of materials we have uh, would be a good sense to begin when we are talking about creating a naming convention for it. Uh, naming Yeah, so you know, uh, sorry, Mithu, since you, we are at it and then just take like 30 seconds, I just wanted to tell you that, you know, when it comes to historical uh, documents, right, and when we have a statesman writing to like, at any given time, 100 odd people, uh, and different kinds of letters, right? Um, addressed to so many people, and then categorizing, and then of course there's personal correspondence at one hand, you know. So when everything is mixed like that, mm -hmm. and to that extent where everything is intermeshed, you know, it's mm -hmm. it to to for me to even think about how am I going to uh, cat, you know, make you know, give codes is becoming mm -hmm. phenomenal difficult. Right. Uh, so that is what I was asking if there is a software which can, you know, a historic, a history based software where if you can think of any uh, historical archive uh, software which can help in, in sorting this sort of a problem out. Uh, that was just what I wanted to ask. Right. Uh, okay. I, I have your question in mind and I'll come back to it a couple of slides after. Yeah. So um, when we talk about creating a naming convention, we are along with uh, a naming convention for the objects, we also are talking about the, the other material information, descriptive material that we have along with it. Uh, now, why this is important to do before we start the act of digitization is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if I, once I have the digitized files, I am looking at a photograph, or I am looking at, uh, say, page in the book that I have digitized. And if I want to go back to those, that actual page from based on the digital file that I have, what, how is that, how can I ease that process? So which is why we start formulating a naming convention and adding as much metadata as we have beforehand of the objects to the physical objects. Um, Again, I'm going to show you another example. Again, this was a photo project. It's a slightly different photo project, but this is uh, an archive of a photographer's work specific to the city of Banaras. Uh, this person has been documenting Banaras for about 20 plus years. And uh, this is, again, just the analog work that you digitize. The digital uh, work is still to be added into this. So here, what we uh, followed was, 
again, a valet is something that has its strips of films which are rolled basically in the form of a film strip. Um, so here, what we a very similar process that we did. If you see the area where I'm moving my mouse on, VD again is the name of the uh, artist. FN is a film negative. PP we saw earlier was a transparency. Uh, and because in this case, we had categorized his entire analog work into different subjects, so we now we knew that this entire work is just Banaras. There'd be another set of analog objects that were MW. There was another set that was, say, uh, Pushkar. So we were able to do that beforehand when we categorized the actual. So that became a part of the naming convention that BNRS represents what Banaras is. And we move on to 006, which is the sixth valet that we digitized, and then moves on to the file number. So this is number one. Uh, this, for example, is number six. So even when I'm looking at the valet, if I have to go back to this, I have to pull out the valet, which is number six, and I know the eighth image sequentially is what I want when I'm looking at, when I go want to go back to this particular digital image. So um, that becomes the naming convention. And then there are other metadata we'll come back to. But along with figuring this naming convention, what we also did was we did add sticker sheets or papers where we had these names written on and which were embedded, which were added to the physical value. So if, I mean, I have digitized these, but how do I know which valet is number six? So when we are categorizing the physical objects, we also named, added these naming conventions to these physical objects. Now these, in this case, this was a photo project, but in a lot of your projects, it might not be limited to photographs. There are prints that you might have. Uh, there are textiles that we saw people have, there are furniture, and a lot of, uh, you also have objects that are functional in nature. So maybe in those cases, this diligent uh, naming convention and adding of the naming convention might not be possible. But again, like I said, it's, there's no one way to do it. So it's, it's absolutely fine if it's not possible to your project. What we focus on is what is of convenience for your individual project. Continuing with the physical repository. So what we did in this project here, again, is if you see the folders that we have the place where I'm hovering my mouse, we have distributed it in the slots of 20. So valet 1 to 19 is what we did was we gathered all those values and they are stored in one box, which has 1 to 20 values because we have how many? We have about 320 valets. So out of the 320 number of valets, if I want to go to sixth, what is what made it easier was to actually also segregate these physical objects into physical spaces, into different boxes. Uh, but this, again, would be possible only if you have, not only, but if you have access to your entire archive, or if you have enough storage space to keep these, because that is another hassle that uh, we as archivists uh, struggle with, because it takes an immense amount of space and immense amount of uh, segregation that we need to do before we do this. So again, repeating, but if it is convenient to our project is when we follow these steps of also physically segregating these things into one space. Um, and along with the names that we are attached to that, it is also makes it easier if we have any other information about that object to add to that list of to that sticker sheet or to that paper, along with uh, the names that we are assigning to these objects. What we'll do is we'll, if I if I see any questions, we'll talk about that and then we'll start working on. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about digitization as well. Uh, so multiple mechanisms, equipments that we have to do the act of. Uh, digitizing, we'll go into. I mean, we go into what those are a little later. And uh, but to informally speak at this moment, 
I think the two primarily most easily accessible and efficient methods right now are one, a flatbed scanner, uh, which is uh, limited in terms of the size that we can do to digitize. A good flatbed scanner that gives good resolution is an A4 format. Uh, there are other flatbed scanners that are larger in scale, but then it really affects the finance of the project that we are in. And the other mechanism that has recently started uh, formalizing in a lot of setups is photographing using digital cameras, using a copying stand. Um, now this is a really flexible process. So we began our uh, archive with flatbed scanners when we when our repository was limited to prints or negatives but now we are in a process where we are digitizing everything from textiles to paintings to uh, really old sari materials or prints that are larger than the a4 size so the setup we have adapted is we have a digital camera which is which is of a good quality which gives out good resolution we have a copying stand and then what we use a lot of copying stands do come with inbuilt lighting setups but what we instead use is studio lights that we can use to customize it to the material that we have a lot of times there are say if you're digitizing a painting it is not possible to for us to take it out from the glass uh, so we have to take care of the reflection that it doesn't show up in the digital uh, file. So there, movement of these uh, studio lights becomes really helpful when you're digitizing. So all in all, the uh, the process of photographing it using studio lights, using copying stands, is I think the most flexible way we can uh, digitize. And what we're going to do at the in the second part of the day is we're going to follow the same process, but with whatever limited resources we have with ourselves at the moment. So what I'll do is I'll start showing you different material projects which had different materials that were digitized and talk about the challenges we met for those for each different projects. So, so Mithil, over it, here, um, just because these questions have come um, and the answers are very short, can I just uh, pitch in two quick things? Mm -hmm. Sure. So Neharika, yes, there are uh, standards and codes. Um, so there's something called Dublin Core, and there's there are many of these versions. Um, this is what we sort of will work with in the next workshop. So when we right. do information cataloging with uh, Sneha, uh, because they work with a more uh, institutional archive. But right. of course, uh, when we meet in the coming week, I'll sort of introduce these frameworks just for you to know. Um, so that's A. And Avni, um, no, the, the flatbed scanners don't heat up, but your question is really about the fragility of paper. So sometimes it's really about the paper that the, the, um, the condition of the paper that will sort of decide what your first question is more appropriate. So it's not the device which is damaging. Or, I mean, that's not the concern, but more to say, can this paper be put inside the scanner or not? Okay. So that is your question over there is self-answering. So looking at the paper quality, you would mm -hmm. decide if you can put it inside any form of a scanner or mm -hmm. would you take a camera? Okay. So right. and then beyond that, yes, I mean, usually when we don't go with uh, scanners or I don't even know scanners, which right now come with heating issues or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. To add to that, there are the scanners available which where you have to feed uh, the document into it. But mm. those are, I mean, I would strictly not recommend those scanners because there's an automated process. You, mm. you don't have control over what is, once you feed this uh, document inside it, you have no control over how it is handled. So uh, even in terms of using scanners instead of digital cameras, a flatbed scanner is the safest way to do it. Okay. And then of course we can take up the uh, digitizing using the digital. So Mithil, there's Priyanjali's question, which she's repeated it because I think it got lost in the thread. Uh, she's asking about storage and preservation of old materials, especially photographs and negatives. Okay. So there are, now this again depends on uh, the, the expanse of your archive. There are the, if, if it is, has, if it's a large archive and I think Shita here, you would be able to answer this better when it comes to 
storage mm. and dehumidifying of what you had done in this Episept archive. Do you want yeah. to introduce that a little bit? So, um, Priyanjali, basically, um, one is yes, when you look at the most formal traditional archives, there are standards in terms of the kind of archival grade boxes that, uh, so you start with the outer case to know. So, you, there are these boxes and um, folders that you basically get. Um, these are these are readily available. So, there are vendors. I mean, they were they were not there earlier, so used we used to import it. But now, within the country, there are vendors who are giving us archival grade boxes. Um, and then um, there's a second layer of protection. So for papers uh, or documents, for example, you would use um, thinner archival grade sheets as separators. Similarly, for negatives and photographs, you do get a certain kind of archival grade plastic. Because the, the difference over here is because of readability of material. So with photographs, um, there is this need or this even with the negatives to be able to you know pick it up and see uh, across the light, which you would be able to relate with. So which is why these plastic sleeves just very similar to how we have seen our photo albums, but the plastic is actually archival grade so that it doesn't stick to your um, photographs or to your negatives. Uh, that sort of becomes a protective layer and then you can so what that happens is you can put many of them under inside the box or the folder that you get um, There are some stuck to old family albums. So yes, this whole dealing with conservation is I am sure we will we'll get into as a separate conversation, but I'm quickly answering it if they are stuck with glues or um, plastic sheets, then you will need to sort of clear that damage, um, but without making sure that that is affecting, I mean, to make sure that nothing happens to the photograph. So sometimes we have come across photographs where we can't remove the tape or we, where we can't remove um, the glue at the back because we know that, you know, it will it will damage the surface of the material. So then we have let them be as it is and you basically cut off the extra tape and then the tape remains. So you must have seen a lot of archival photographs where you will see the tape scanned along or digitized along with the drawing. It's because as an archivist or a conservator, you take a decision that removing it is more damaged than keeping it. Uh, materials like metal obviously have to be removed because they get corroded um, and they will eventually damage. So rubber or um, uh, even metal for that matter of fact, which can have a long term lasting effect, you sort of remove them. Um, but again, it all has to be done very carefully. Um, I'm not sure if it's stuck to plastic sheets. Um, yes, you will eventually have to remove it because that is anyways not going to help it in the long term. Uh, your color will fade away or your your material will get damaged. If it is done in collaboration with the conservator, then they do have more specific chemicals to sort of help um, ensure that nothing happens to it. And these are questions I think come back to you, Mithul. So we added yeah. the photographs and resolution. Uh, can I just quickly ask a question here, Rishita, in yeah, continuation no. to what you said? So you spoke of uh, how one can preserve photographs and negatives, etc. Uh, this mm. to both you and Mithul, when it comes to slides, is there any separate uh, system of preserving slides? Or again, you go back to archival plastic to preserve it, like those albums, folders that you get. So it's, yeah, it's the same thing. So when I said, uh, and when I show you that presentation on these materials that's available, you will see that these uh, folders or these uh, sleeves, they come for all different sizes. So uh -huh. there is slides, scale sleeves, there are negative scale sleeves, there are sleeves for glass slides also. Uh -huh. um, actually, no, glass slides, we didn't use sleeves. The paper is better for that because these are heavier objects. Uh -huh. um, the only, de in the, the benefit we uh, observed ourselves is slides are better protected than negatives. Mm -hmm. So when slides came in boxes, we decided to keep them as it is rather than move them into the sleeves mm -hmm. because there was a set uh, order that the author or the photographer had worked with or even the artist. And because slides come with the, the framing of the board mm -hmm. that we know of, it's already protecting it well enough. And it leaves the room between two materials. So if it is kept in a well-protected um, environment uh, mm -hmm. in terms of humidity and all, then the sleeve is not required. OK, thank you. Uh, just last point to add to uh, this answer. Uh, apart from these things, uh, based on the expanse of the material that you have, there is uh, something called a dry box, which has control where you can control the humidity, the mm -hmm. moisture that goes inside. Okay. So a dry box, after following all these processes of keeping them into sleeves, that could be spaces where you could store the uh, negatives and the slides that you have. 
Thank you. Rupal, I think uh, your question of uh, do we put labels on these actual slide boxes is now answered? Yeah, yes. that's right. Best device for disguising old fragile papers scanners. So when it comes to the fragility of the papers, I believe uh, both uh, options. I'm answering Avni's question here. Uh, scanners versus digital uh, SLRs are equally good or equally bad because in both the cases, there is uh, an exposure of light onto the documents. But what I would, what would separate these is the way you handle them in each of these processes. For a flatbed, you have to put it on a glass surface. In terms of when you're photographing it, there is ne not necessarily a glass surface pressed upon the digital, uh, upon the artifact while you're photographing. So there's at least some, there's on one side of it, there's no other material touching the, uh, the document right. as against the digital scanner. Mm. Okay. But the end quality will not be impacted. We'll have to decide just based on the condition of the document is what I understand. No, the end quality will also, so even with photographing with digital uh, SLRs, just the fact that your digital, what SLR you're using, what lenses you're using, what is mm -hmm. the resolution of the camera in itself mm -hmm. will give you varied uh, kinds of resolutions of it. Mm -hmm. So there's no one uh, format of, judging what will give a better resolution. Even in terms of scanners, there are scanners that give varied kinds of resolutions. There are some expensive ones that give you a really high resolution. But again, before we get into that, what is important to answer is what is the end use of that document? Mm -hmm. Planning to print them in the size of a billboard, in that case, really high resolution scans are important. And we can then invest uh, in terms of our time and money into getting into that. But if it is going to remain a digital format, or if you want to print it in the form of a book, which might not be bigger than say 12 inches, mm. then maybe digitizing them to that larger resolution might not be necessary. For right. Okay. So Mithil, one last point, and maybe you can correct me also, but I think even this whole decision between whether scan or photograph is also quite important, right? Because um, in an archive, we've seen that you use both methods as well. So uh, I'm referring to, for example, drawings, which need to be seen at a certain scale, uh, which, may, which need uh, to be seen for the quality that you get, which is better at scanned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, versus when you're looking at an object or an exhibition material, when mm -hmm. it's, it, you, even if you don't get the exact elevation of it or a 3D form of it is much better to look at, you choose mm -hmm. photography. So mm -hmm. isn't that also there when you, when you understand your content, basically? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that uh, reminds me of another point where the, the speed at which we get to digitize this is also a factor you keep in mind while you are choosing a mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, a scanner will take a relatively larger time for the same resolution compared to a photograph, uh, compared to a camera that we use for digitization. Uh, in both the scanner and the camera, there are ways to control. So a scanner will be able to give you a resolution starting from 300 DPI. We talk about what these terms are to 6400 DPI. So for example, this photograph that I that you see on the screen, it's a three inch by four inch photograph. But uh, the way I have digitized this, and I believe I have also resized this. So the original photograph, I can I've digitized it at the, such a scale that if I want to make a print of this as big as four feet, I can do that uh, because I've chosen the resolution of the on which I want to scan it at that level. Now, the higher the resolution you take, the larger time it takes to scan. So these are the multiple such things that you need to keep in mind before choosing a mechanism of digitizing. Do we edit the photographs while digitizing or keep original colors? So. Uh, Maybe editing is something that is a part of the process, but again, as we talked about earlier, that's a call. I mean, for me personally, whatever object is that I'm digitizing, I would like to have the original as is without any editing, uh, a copy of that with me. 
and if at all i decide to edit or make any changes at my end on my wrist i would make another copy of it a digital copy of it so that we always know for example just uh, this photograph yeah so the one of this the one on the left is the original print that i have right and, and the one on the right is where i have one straightened the photograph i it was my call that i want the border to be seen so again depending on your usage if you're using it say in an exhibition in a in an art exhibition i would want people to see what border did this have uh the quality of the image but as against if i want to use it as a book as an illustration i don't need the us to see what size the photograph was or what format the photograph was so that's a call that needs to be taken uh as and when the time comes uh, so are the uh, your question of a non object based materials like autocad drawings your uh I mean, it's a really interesting question to bring in at this time because when we were talking about keeping in mind technology in the future, uh, yes, AutoCAD might be present, say, twenty years down the line. But uh, what file systems do we follow to save our uh, files is important. And when it comes to utilizing uh, an object. what we recommend is to keep them in high resolution tiff files the originals then the second set of files can be uh, jpegs uh, in low resolution which are easier to share and not necessarily the higher resolution tiff file can be shared so in terms of autocad drawings uh, of course keep the original format of the autocad drawing but other than that also produce maybe a pdf copy of each of these drawings okay and, Okay. Also, will depend on what you and tend to do it at the end of it. For example, if you're planning to produce high-resolution archival-grade prints of things, then maybe the printer might require TIFF files. So, based on uh, the usage of what you're going to, based on the usage of the file, mm. again, you know how to divide the uh, format to what file format to save these. Okay, so it actually depends on what the end use is. That will depend. That will decide what format and the resolution you require. The end use is, and keeping in mind also the uh, technological obsolescence. So, for example, yeah. if there are uh, certain uh, files in Corel Draw, uh, hmm. we see the usage of Corel Draw is very fast increasing, and there's a chance five years down the line we might not have the software. Not so, what it. do you do with the CDR files? Yeah. So. that in mind something like a pdf we can predict it might not go away as soon as say a corel draw so also to keep in mind the technological obsolescence we decide the format in which we uh, store and back up these files okay all right thanks so two other inputs i have on this um, interestingly autocad is um, sort of coming back with this whole idea of opening up archives which is quite interesting because when we started in 2013 this wasn't really something that was heard of um but now autodesk is offering you a service of opening the old files so unlike uh, the cassettes or the tapes which will always have to be digitized by a um, showroom so that is one thing um so these kind of things are going to be seems like going to be a probability that the, the way things are changing the softwares themselves will come up with because the open file as you would understand uh, is always going to be more relevant to migrate uh, rather than have a reproduction and the second thing is um while you might decide on the basis of the content and the output uh, especially with the collection of your size uh, it will be a bit of a nightmare if you say these many files will be tiff these many files will be pdf these many files yeah. will be jpeg so you will have to work with the basic denominator so even out of th uh, 300 files if 200 100 files would be used for exhibition then ideal to do take that method up for all 300 files which is work with tiff and then create a pdf a and then create your re uh, reproductions out of it okay, okay. we'll go back 
to this at the end of the process we are talking about backups uh, keeping storing backups of these files but mm -hmm. um, one uh, non negotiable i think is keeping at least a couple of backups of the original format that you have absolutely um, yeah. and then maybe in the second or third backup we might not need to keep all these file formats because we can always reproduce the uh, jpegs from a high resolution pic right? okay thanks uh, are there any other questions? I can we move on to. Yeah, so Vishwesh also had a question what resolution and format do we scan the images at? Uh, again, that is really one material dependent to end user dependent. <clears throat> For If I were to give you an example, a negative, the size of a 35mm I would have is 1.5 inches by 1 inches. Uh, and say a print of 8 by 12. I if I reproduce if I digitize the print of 8 by 12 at 300 dpi, I can reproduce the print in the print uh, reproduce a, a newer inkjet print at the same size 8 by 12 with the 300 resolution. But if I am scanning the negative also at 300 uh, dpi resolution, I can only reproduce it of that scale of that size. So for a film of that small size, I would rather digitize it at a 3200 DPI, where I'll be able to 3200 by 300, where I'll be able to get at least a 10 by 8 good quality, where it is not the uh, pixel, it's not pixelating. Uh, I'll get that amount of uh, file size, which I can easily reproduce in the print format of that scale. Uh, so we'll also I'll go to certain projects that I'll show where, where we'll uh, talk about this question. So this is just a slideshow of different formats that we digitize, and I'll talk about what methods we use. So this was these were prints that were very small, of 4 by 4 inches or 4 by 3 inches, where uh, we used a scanner to digitize these. There was no urgency of, there was no timeline to get these. So the factor of scanner will take more time was not something that we were covered with. Um, here, now, this uh, question of how much of the actual file to keep, how much to crop that we talked in the first photograph. Now here, this, these are my personal archives. So here I found it, I mean, I found it necessary to keep this little sticker of the studio that this was photographed in. Right. So, and depending on how I decide to use it later on, I will take a call whether I want to keep the entire thing or not. But at this moment, I want this information of where this was photographed, in what location, in what city, in what studio. And uh, when you were talking about metadata and applying it into the physical format, and then this is an example of the metadata that I would, that I would add to the physical, and then once it is digitized to the digital files. Uh, similarly, again with this, I can maybe just in the future I will decide to only use the photograph and not these things. But for me, these hold a certain value. Uh, the name of uh, the person who is in the photograph, that's my uncle, the year in which this was taken, at the age at which he would have been at that point of time. And then, of course, there's like innumerable amount of dece deciphering you can do from the image itself. Okay. So I'll show another project, which is uh, which was watercolors. It's not archival material. We were presently created watercolors from artists, which we wanted to digitize. And the intention was to reproduce them in form of inkjet prints. Um, this will cover a little bit of the post-processing part uh, that we'll move on to further. So there are two more questions if you want to address them. Someone is asking if there are more softwares beyond Photoshop or post-processing. And mm -hmm. then Richard's question about how does one scan maps drawings as big as A2 or bigger? In terms of softwares for post-processing, I think Photoshop is the most standard and universal software that we can do when it comes to color correction or post-processing. But uh, if we are talking about processes of, say, cropping or de-skewing the images 
or uh, adding metadata. So there are other softwares, some that come along with the mechanism that you're using to digitize. For example, a scanner will allow you to uh, give you a, I mean, allow you to we decide the name you want to add to the file while you digitize it. Uh, there are other softwares like Bridge that will allow you to batch insert uh, metadata into your files. And I mean, I'm sure there are other color correction softwares as well, but Photoshop, most reliable, most stable, and we know it's not going anywhere. And uh, what it, the other advantage of Photoshop is also we can work in a non-destructible way. So I can always add layers to the original file. We'll come to this when I'm when we're actually processing the file in Photoshop, but we can add layers to the original file so that if I want to take off some a layer of color change that I have done in the file, we just talk about that while I'm showing this. I can always go back to it. So this was a postcard uh, sized watercolor painting at the I think a four by six and the intent was to reproduce it as big as we can uh, on a digital inkjet printer. And so the, this again, I believe was scanned. So that we kept that in mind and scanned it. So now I can go up to as large as this size. Here, if you see, I have this file at the size of eight by 11, but at a 450 resolution. Now on an inkjet print, I can go to as low as 150. So I'll be able to reproduce this exact color without any destruction of the pixels or color at the size of 24 by 33 inches from a four by six postcard. So, these, uh, like we talked about, are ways where you get to decide what resolution you want to scan these at. Right, and moving to the process. So this is what the original scan uh, file was. And then we had to work upon each individual areas to actually match the colors that we see on the postcard on the digital screen. So after all of that work, this is what we came to. This is the closest to the color reproduction of the actual painting on the digital file. And uh, the layers that I mentioned earlier. Again, in this case, uh, another added element that was there was reproducing these on an inkjet archival paper. So each, when we were trying to print this, each paper has its own inherent uh, quality. On say a luster gloss paper, the <clears throat> colors will appear darker than what you see on the screen. So we had to take that into mind while we were processing it. So some of these group layers that you see on the right are done specifically to get the colors right on the print after we get the color right on the screen. So here, if you, <clears throat> when I'm toggling this group on and off, I believe you will see a, a big change in the blue that's in the photograph. Is that is that visible? So colors like blue, red are also relatively more uh, difficult and troublesome when it comes to digitizing because they are they're the two ends of the spectrum, the warm and the <clears throat> cold spectrum. So we had to put in really a lot of efforts in post-processing once we had the file digitized to get the actual blue that we saw in the watercolor. And again, a medium like watercolor, if I were to show you another example, uh, is the new image visible to all of you right now? So um, talking about watercolors, when we digitize this, if you see here, the hands are really merging into the, the white. So the quality of watercolors is that the transparency is something that is you really have to take care of when you're digitizing it. So the original had this where the hands are really being, there's no defining line uh, of the hands in the image. So this we had to really work upon to get the outline 
line where the image where the drawing ends and the white begins so again different mediums will pose different challenges uh, for digitizing your objects and uh, i think we can put a pause on the presentation at this moment we'll go to other projects that i want to show uh, and we can take up the exercise uh, now vishita does that sound okay yeah i think uh, giving everybody 10 minutes to think about that exercise um, and then a lunch break sounds like sure. a good plan so that when we come back um, we can maybe make, yeah uh, go on to the production and the exercise which you had in mind the main exercise yeah right. uh, so a quick time, exercise here. sorry yeah please please I'm go sorry. ahead who was i'm, I'm sorry i'm waiting for who was speaking that was me only i was just saying that i think rupal's question lightroom against photoshop um I'm assuming it could get covered in the second half when you show us things on Lightroom as well. That's the plan. Yes. And then the yes, first question come. about how does one scan maps drawings as big as A2 or bigger? I mean, there are options of say flat, large format flatbed scanners, and I'll come to that when we are talking about these mechanisms. But anything other than the flatbed scanner and the digital camera setup is extremely expensive. So just one. Uh, buying something like that is something which before which we really need to think about the utility of it and the investment that you might want to make into that so uh, right now what we use is a digital camera setup and with studio lights and we've been able to reproduce paintings of size as big as 14 feet uh and there are ways to do that based on again the resolution that you might need but if it was a 14 feet painting and if i wanted to reproduce it at the on a one and one is to one scale the method is you photograph it in pieces and then you complete the collage into the post processing software i'll show you an example of that once we come back uh, after the exercise and after lunch of where we needed to reproduce the fine pencil work on a larger scale and how we went about doing that i can also add a bit of experience here um simply because we had lots of drawings right mithul at sept archives mm -hmm. um or even now at uh, biome so with i do agree when mithul says that the rolling scanner is not good um but if the papers were in good condition i mean we went with a lot of test prints before we um, sort of uh, resorted to the roller scanner but because photography of those many 200 300 drawings would have been a nightmare we did resolve to um, rolling scanners of course we didn't invest into it so what he's saying is right it, it we were, we had outsourced it uh, we had somebody come in and set up the system and sort of they were equally responsible or trained to work with uh, you know archival grade material and stuff like that but uh, we never put in paper which was damaged so if there was any tear if there was any worry in terms or any smudging possible those we never put in under um, roller scanner so those for one of uh, specific papers let's say 10 out of those 300 we would resort to photography or a more um, less destructive method or less scary method and rest of it went into a roller scanner so that's that's because the size is such that's why yes so uh, a quick mental exercise is uh, based on what we have uh, talked about and learned up until now i would uh, suggest you to think about general naming conventions one categorization of the objects that you have or the, that you plan to have and uh, formulate a naming convention for each of these categories uh to keep in mind this is not something that we are planning that you might want to use finally when you are working with it but this is just an exercise to brainstorm what ways we can uh go on to formulate these uh, naming conventions and uh, categorization 
So I've shared the Excel sheet where you can try this um, answering these two questions. Um, it's the same Excel sheet where you were entering your devices. In that there are two columns. Uh, we can make them a little broader so that there's enough space for everyone to write. And um, just just wrap the text once you fill in your entry. Is that right, Mitha? Can you? Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you just repeat the question uh, like again? And yeah. give one example with it. Yes. Uh, so the question I was posing is: uh, I would like you to one uh, form categories uh, of the repository that you have, and uh, based on the categories, formulate a naming convention for say files in that category. For example, in your case, you I know you have certain pieces of furniture and certain pieces of jewelry. So these automatically are became become two categories. You can further decide to categorize your furniture based on its functionality, or for to categorize your jewelry based on the material. And then form a naming convention, which we looked at in the beginning, where uh, the kind of two conventions that I showed where we were categorizing the DP <coughs> file the negatives in the DPPP file format uh, and the other the lightning catalog that I showed. For ease of access, for uh, easy retrieval connection between the digital and the physical file. So keeping in mind these things, a couple of naming conventions uh, if you can come up with at the end of this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.